Thanks to everyone for joining us for this morning's episode of Coffee and Conversation. I'm Pete McIntaggart, the managing editor of Grepbeat, which I know you all subscribe to. Uh, today's episode is sponsored by the Hutchison Law Firm. Quick shout out to Jody Coverly, who is their director of marketing and business development for being the fastest email replier in the triangle. Today's topic is angel investing in the triangle, and we've got three great guests who, even if they'd never invested a dime, would still be literal angels. I think uh, it might be a stretch, but maybe Jan, I don't know. Uh, so let's meet the three of them. Uh, we'll do it alphabetically. So Jan Davis, uh, among many other things, uh, she's an investor in Triangle Angel Partners, member of the Carolina Angel Network, CAN, member of the investment committee at the Launch Place, and according to the Grepeat newsletter, She's one of the two most helpful and generous networkers in the triangle. Uh, Mark Friedman is currently the president of RTP Capital Associates and the portfolio manager of The Launch Place, which uh, has offices in Danville, Virginia, and also now in RTP. And he was formerly an aspiring sports broadcaster. I'm totally unclear. Uh, and Randy Meyer is the managing director of the Carolina Angel Network. Uh, can, as we know, and he's a professor of entrepreneurship at UNC's Keenan Flagler Business School. And he's also coming to us today from Vermont, which is not quite as humid. Um, so thanks everyone uh, for, for coming. And so let's dive in by, why don't you tell us, we could sort of go around and tell us a little bit about, you know, your current angel group or angel investing um, and uh, maybe start with you, Jan. Okay. Um, so I've been involved with Triangle Angel Partners um, since the first fund. Um, we're now on fund two, and we probably have one more deal, maybe two more deals to invest in. Um, we have uh, dry powder for follow-on investments in, um, in the companies that are in our portfolio. I'm also an investor in, or a member, not an investor, uh, in Excel Ventures, which is a, a group of women who want to invest in women-led businesses. And the model there is um, debt only. And we are very young and have not yet made any investments. Uh, I'll point to one difference um, between Triangle Angel Partners and the other um, Excel and can and um, Duke Angels and Wolfpack Investors and RTP Capital even. Those are all our all networks. Uh, can, uh, CAP is a fund, so it, we have committed capital. Fund one, we had 2.8 million, fund two, just over four. Okay, uh, great, Ed. Uh, Mark, what about uh, RTP? Sure, uh, as Jan said, RTP Capital is a network. And it's amazing to me, we've been around since 2010 now, and it really started with four of us that wanted to do some angel investing in the triangle because uh, the earlier angel groups that had existed, primarily um, Tri-State Investment Group, TIG, which I was part of, had run the course. And there was very little angel investing going on, so we decided we wanted to see if we could find some companies that looked interesting for us to invest in, and if other people wanted to join us, they were welcome to. And um, Lo and behold, it's grown to an organization that's around 60, 65 members. Um, totally organic growth. We've never advertised. Um, it's really a member bringing in another member. And we look to invest in early stage companies. And I know Pete wants to talk about the differences between networks and funds, which we'll do in a little bit. Um, we no wanted spoilers. to have... Network. Come on. I said no spoilers, what? but I'm just kidding. You know what? Go ahead. <laughs> so we, we decided we, we liked the network model and it really didn't exist in any form back then. So we just made it from scratch and we found out afterwards there, there are a good number of networks in the country. We just didn't know. So we formed RTP Capital the way the four of us wanted it to be. And it's evolved and morphed over the years. And uh, you know, as you mentioned before, I'm also part of the launch place, as is Jan, which is uh, out of Danville, Virginia and uh, RTP. And they're a very interesting organization as well. They're, they're a fund, but set up differently than... Um, most angel funds that they don't have limited partners as part of it, other than a group of um, different organizations that have invested. So would they, would you consider Launch Place, an, do they consider themselves an angel network or just more of a seed stage? Uh, 
Yeah, it, it's a matter of semantics. It, right. They invest similarly to angel groups and angel funds. They invest in the same kind of companies. So <laughs> seed stage, angel, whatever you want to call it, it's right. generally early stage investments. Would you agree with that, uh, Jan? Yes, absolutely. They, they will invest very early, one of the earliest investors with the pre-seed fund, and then um, will invest in the same types of companies that have or can will invest in fact with syndicated um, with with our capital and with and with capital. Uh, Randy, how about uh, a little can and maybe some history there, and then the other the triangle of venture alliance. Sure. Well, we're we're the youngster in the among the group here. Um, we were formed three years ago along with uh, Duke, Dan, Duke Angel Network, and Win the Wolfpack one. Um, so we're the we're the youngsters in, uh, in the category. Um, it's kind of an interesting category, Pete. There's uh, somewhere around 50 universities now that have alumni networks. That's basically what we are. Uh, right. we're very similar to RTP, but we have about 200 members that we've, um, that we've gotten in the last three years. And, uh, and it's a network, so they make their own decisions to invest. We've done, uh, done 19 first round deals in the three years and seven second round deals in that time period. So, uh, and you know, it's been quite a bit of money that's come through those three organizations. It's almost 40 million from the three organizations that have been invested in the last three and a half years. So that's us. So I had a question, how did, some nice folks like you get involved in angel investing in the first in the first place. Any of you uh, sort of jump in? Go ahead, Randy. I uh, I've always wondered, Pete, and I think you should do an article on the derivation of the word angel and where it came from and why we people think we're angels, like some angelic thing that dropped out of the sky and became, you know, uh, but I do think that uh, there is a sense of probably the three of us and more of people who are interested in how our, our world is changing and what are the newest technologies coming along. And, and so I think there is an interest level among these individuals that we call angels um, it isn't necessarily because of the financial return, because we all know it's a high risk category. Um, I think they just like being involved in this kind of, you know, early stage review analysis and decision process. So, but you have to do the analysis, Pete, on what, where angel came from, the word angel came from. So. Oh, we, we can, uh, does anyone have a view? Like how would we even define an angel? Angels invest out of their own money compared to venture capitalists right. who raise money from other people and invest it. So when, when we write a check, it's coming out of our own um, assets. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, you know, one of my pet peeves in this uh, whole realm has been the word angel because it gives the connotation that people just want to invest out of the goodness of their heart and they want to help businesses uh, as the primary goal. And certainly we want to do that. It's why you become an angel investor. You want to work with, you know, promising early stage companies, mm -hmm. but the connotation that you're just, you know, throwing money at businesses to help them kind of as a nonprofit in the word angel is just not, it's a misnomer. So, you know, it's amateur venture capitalist, you know, kind of yeah, really call ourselves that. As Jan pointed out, whether it's TAP or RTB Capital, you're investing your own money. Uh, angels are there, they're putting in their own money to invest. So part, part of what I love about it is <clears throat> you get to see so many ideas and so much enthusiasm, and so much energy that you know, when you're a full-time employee, which many angels are, um, it kind of gets you out of your day-to-day -day job and lets you see a lot of other things and enthusiasm. And, you know, when I was working full-time and angel investing on the side, uh, it, it's one of the things that kept me going it really was fun to get that energy and it just goes into you and you get a chance to work with some really great people. How do you guys feel the angel community in the triangle has sort of changed in the last 
five or 10 years. I mean, it sounds like it's much more active in general. Yeah, I, I mean, it's exploded. I mean, uh, RTB Capital started in 10, uh, TAP started in 11, and there really wasn't, I mean, there were individuals who invested alone, uh, but not, not, they weren't at all, they were not easy to find. And I, since then, we've had um, Duke Angels, Carolina Angels, Wolfpack Investor Network, um, Mulch Place. I mean, there's just a lot more money uh, and a lot more groups and Excel. And there's a lot more money and a lot more um, groups to talk to than there were a decade ago. I'd say the other thing too that that's happened, Jan, and I give a shout out to Mark on this, is we have a syndicate meeting, what every other uh, once a month, I think, or yeah. And that syndicate meeting we had one yesterday, Pete. It had probably fifteen to twenty people on it on the call, all the way from Wilmington to Charlotte, um, to you know, and so. There is the ability to put together a syndicate is way easier than it was three years ago, and and raise three or four million dollars. Um, so I think it's a combination of yeah, we've had some new players like our university stuff, but also a really good network of syndication that has helped. What can you just explain syndication syndicates a little bit? Sure. Well, um, basically. When you think about co-investing, um, let's say a deal comes along and Mark sees it first, and it you know gets through the RTP screening process, he's going to tell us in the meeting that you know here's the one we're looking at, and that will pique an interest from seven or eight other people on the call, and all of a sudden, you know we're in touch with that company and we get them scheduled in and next thing you know you have five or six of us investing in a deal and putting together two million dollars which you know going back to the early days of rtp and tap because i'm in both of them you know that would that that number wouldn't even seem reasonable in today's mm -hmm. environment so yeah yeah and that was all you know, with an rtp capital this particular call Say that again. The this syndicate is this all RTP capital people or no 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 the syndicate call is the um, heads or representatives of all the different entities in okay. the area. So one one of the things I've done over the last year or so, <clears throat> which plays right into the syndicate work, is try to get the entire ecosystem a little more cohesive. You know, we're seen from the outside, the area outside of the triangle as one of the top areas in the country for early stage activities. And it's partly because of the angels, partly because of the universities and entrepreneurship programs. We hosted um, the Angel Capital Association, which is the national group of angel investors, uh, the Southeast Regional Conference last year. And we had 170 people come from 11 different states. And it was by far the biggest attendance they ever had for a regional meeting. And it was because people wanted to see what's all the, the hubbub about the triangle. So, you know, we look at things internally and, you know, we have our own skeletons. We try to fix nothing's perfect, but there's so much attention in this area that comes from the early stage activities. So, so you guys, this was something I did want to get into. So there is basically some formal cooperation between the various angel groups. Uh, in angel networks uh, in, in the triangle and how long has that been going on we had these syndicate meetings we used to go back and forth between the cafe carolina meadowmont and the one in Cary, uh oh. in person oh. and, and that started probably in 2012 um and but now i think since you're doing it via zoom it's a lot easier for people who are out of the area to participate and it means that people don't have to drive through, um, you know, 8 a.m. traffic back and forth across the triangle. So I, th I think it's a big improvement, but it's been going on. Um, I mean, um, back in the early part of the century or the decade, I guess, um, it was hard to put together even a half a million dollars. And now, like Randy said, we can, we can get people around the table um, and with the members from, the university syndicates who are from all over and from um, Venture South, which has branches all over, we can, we can put together some money. 
Yeah, it's uh, it's really a big improvement. And you know, one of the other things that I've been trying to do is break down this kind of invisible wall that exists on I-40 that stops anything going from Charlotte to Raleigh and, and Charlotte to the Triangle and vice versa. And that um, Angel Capital Association conference, we had hardly any representation from mm-hmm. Charlotte. So it's, it, it, there's so much going on in the Charlotte area that we just don't know about here. It's, um, they've got a great entrepreneurial uh, ecosystem there as well. We need to figure out how we can get those a little closer. Why do you feel there is so much more angel money now than five or 10 years ago? What are some of the factors for that? Well, I, I think one is that, you know, between Mark 60 to 80 people and TAP, which probably has what, about 53 managers or thereabouts? Fund, fund one, we had, I think, 53. Fund two, we have, I think, 74. Yeah, so if you added those two together, you'd probably get 120 people. Yeah. Uh, the, the three universities have over 500 uh, new investors. So all of a sudden, Pete, you've got 650 or 700 angel investors within 15 miles of each other. And, uh, and that doesn't count, you know, the Charlotte Angel Group or Charleston or We've even done deals with Tamiami down in Tampa and Miami. So, you know, we're reaching out. Aim in Alabama is another one. So we're reaching out farther because I think they recognize that there are good deals in the triangle and people they trust that are here that will evaluate them for them. Yeah, actually, one of the strongest relationships we have is with a group in New Orleans, uh, New Orleans uh, Angels, NOLA. I think there are a couple other... I think there are a couple of, of kind of driving factors. Uh, one in the in uh, the 2010-2011, people's personal assets were recovering from the Great Recession. Right. And so as the public markets have improved, it's meant that people felt a little bit more comfortable taking on the risk because angel investing is higher risk and it's illiquid. So you can't you can't necessarily, you can't, unless there's some kind of an exit, get at the assets that you've put into this, this uh, kind of an investment. Um, so I think that people felt more comfortable risking money. I think that, I know TAP has done a lot of recruiting um, and talking about it and making presentations. I know Excel's uh, mission is to get more women involved in angel investing because they're not that many. Mm-hmm. And um, the, the leaders there have really done a great job of, of recruiting women who want to dip a toe in the water. Do you think it plays a role that, uh, I mean, just the way, especially SaaS companies are now, a half a million can go a lot further for a very early stage company than it could have 10 years ago. And now, you know, you don't need servers and things can be on the cloud. I mean, is there almost, you mentioned angels, you can get together more money, but is there also more impact from that really early stage investing perhaps now? That might be another reason to attract angels. Well, I, I think one thing that, that helps is, is we look at uh, use, of, use of funds you know, in these presentations, including SaaS-based ones. There's a lot more that's going into building the team, building the sales force, building the product development, you know, by, by hiring people as opposed to infrastructure kinds of stuff that you're talking about, Pete. Right. I mean, now look at what we're doing now with remote, you know, why do you really need an office uh, as, a, as an example? So it's, it's going directly into growing the business in a way that is probably more efficient than five years ago. And, but, you know, it puts a lot of pressure on hiring a quality team. Um, and that's, um, that's a skill set that uh, you have to look for in these entrepreneurs is can they build a team? Can they build a culture? Can they hire the right people and so on and so forth? Yeah, I think the issue you're talking about, Pete, is kind of a two edged sword in some ways. It's yes, it, it definitely helps companies be able to start with uh, raising lower funds on um, on the SaaS space, but also there's a lot of ideas that could be put into place that aren't really well thought out because it doesn't take that much money to 
right. put together a, a product. So you see, as Randy was saying, you know, the teams aren't in place. Very often you'll see a product that's developed. It could look really nicely, but when it goes out into the market and, and really needs to be scaled, you see that it was just thrown together and not ready for scaling. It doesn't have the security built into it and has to be rewritten from scratch. So those, those are all issues you have to look into. We don't just fund SaaS businesses too. Right. I mean, we fund uh, materials businesses and um, some consumer products. So, and all of those take different kinds of funding right. scenarios. What do you feel are some of the benefits that a strong angel community sort of brings to this area? I mean, any area, but especially this area. Well, I do think um, the fact that we're a fairly tight um, network of people. I mean, you cited Jan as our number two networking person, but people around here are really helpful and really volunteer and give their time, even when it's not a direct, you know, funding opportunity necessarily. And so I think the collegiality of the area um, distinguishes it, say, from New York or Silicon Valley. So you can connect to one or two or three people, and you're then going to get connected to a lot of different groups and people and so on and so forth. We know a lot about what each of us does. So, you know, you can say, okay, you need to go talk to Mark. Here's how you apply to RTP Capital or you need to go talk to Venture South. Here's the person you want to contact. Use my name. So I think there's a collegiality, Pete, that helps here. Well, it's also, it's also I don't know of any area in the country, and I've dealt with angel air, uh, groups in a lot of different areas in this country, talking to them. I, I don't know an area in the country that has more collaboration between the different groups and the trust that's built between us. There's never been a time where a company comes to us and I have any hesitation to hook Randy in or, or Jan or any of the other people that are involved in angel networks. In other parts of the country where there may be more money sitting around the table in individual groups, there's this fear sometimes that if I, if I tell group A about company X, group A is going to steal it from me and I'm not going to get a chance to invest. That doesn't happen in this marketplace. At least I, I've never witnessed it. And I think you two would agree with that. I think the other thing is, is that, um, to pile on to what Randy was saying, people here are so willing to help. Um, I, I, there are very few people here that won't have coffee and um, with an entrepreneur who's trying to figure out whether or not they're funding ready or uh, wants to talk about funding. Um, there are so many people who are uh, not just willing, but eager to serve as advisors or on boards. And I think that, that um, those of us who've been involved in startups in the past or uh, run growth companies, um, we can often help young, particularly young entrepreneurs, but sometimes even mature entrepreneurs, avoid some potholes that we may have fallen in ourselves over the years. It's funny, they used to talk about Silicon Valley and one of the advantages of Silicon Valley was that you can go into a coffee shop and be talking about an idea and there's a lawyer sitting next to you that could write up the, the idea and get you going in the same day. You know, pre-COVID, hey, you couldn't go into Starbucks in RTP, you know, on, over on uh, Page Road without running into Merrill Mason or, you know, somebody, uh, Andy Schwab. Or I met you. Or me. Yep. Or the Coffee. County Carolina and Cary. I, mm -hmm. It's amazing how many people I run into there or ran into there. I think one of the thing, <laughs> one other thing, Pete, is that uh, we've been uh, willing to share due diligence um, right. among groups. Right. And I think that's huge because, yeah. you know, you have only in, in the smaller groups, you only have so many people working on the due diligence. But when you put together five entities, uh, launch place or whatever, and we're all doing due diligence and then we share it, we, we benefit by the quality of our that, due diligence. I mean, from the entrepreneur's perspective, that is so much better than, you know, having to pitch to everyone and kind of start from uh, from from square one. So that that is that's definitely very entrepreneur friendly. How would you guys kind of distinguish 
the angel networks from the VCs here? Like what are things that maybe the angel networks are, it's a better fit for them or they're a little better at versus, you know, on the other hand, like that's more something for a VC uh, than us. How do you sort of coexist with them and maybe distinguish what do you guys do from what, from what they do? Say a co-founder is a bull city idea. Sometimes, sometimes we actually not infrequently, we syndicate with them. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think you have to be careful whether you're comparing a group like RTB Capital, which is a network, right. than a group like Launch Place or TAP, which is a fund. The advantage the fund has is they have a single investment into that organization. So it's more like a VC investment. And they can get somebody on the board because they're putting in a, you know, the one investor has a, you know, right. a fairly yeah. red line on the cap table. Yeah. yeah. So it's a little different with the network where you have a bunch of smaller individual investors. Now, a network the size of CAN or, or the other university networks could function that way as well. They get you know, good size uh, investments going into these organizations. Yeah, I do think also, yeah. Pete, Pete, that, that um, you know, we, we have the three, you know, entities that you mentioned are not big funds. I mean, they're 30 million, right. 40 million. So, when we're doing mostly series A deals, we can do it with them. But once you start to go for the, you know, 15 million or $20 million series B or C, you know, we have to rely on finding those, that network and that's where their network helps you to the next level, so to speak. Now, I mean, when we had InterSouth, that was very helpful and certainly Hatteras is well big enough to, to uh, take on a, a, B, a series B or, or C, but but in the IT world, we we still have that shortage of next level, and so we have to depend on them and their network. Yeah, I, I think one of the notable things in the triangle is that people don't know the names of all the different investment groups that are here. You know, you've got others that are sitting here. You've got Accelerate, which invests in healthcare IT. You've got Rex Ventures that has their own healthcare IT. There, there are other groups of funds that are around that um, not everybody knows about. There is a good amount of money in the triangle that's available. Sometimes you have to hunt, but the resources for the entrepreneurs are significant too. They're all listed if people look. And all of us are willing to make connections where appropriate. I mean, we're not yeah, going to send a, we're not going to send a consumer product to um, Rex Health Ventures or to Accelerate Health or, or co-founders because they do B two B software. Yep, yeah. and you know, co-founders comes to our meetings. David's part of our group. Um, we often have somebody from Idea Funds or uh, Bull City that comes. Bobby Baram from Accelerate and Andy Schwab were two of the original founding members of RTP Capital. So, you know, when you say it's a cohesive area, it really is. Do you, most of the uh, angel networks uh, invest? I think Jan, you sort of mentioned this a bit, but you know, so it's not just tech. I mean, it, how, how much are there life sciences? Uh, consumer, what is sort of the range? Uh, you know, because we met uh, co-founders, they're very, very focused. But are you guys more, in general, a broader uh, brush? I think the one thing that that um, that TAP totally excludes is um, pharmaceuticals. Right. We don't have enough capital, but we we've, right. we've done med devices, we've done some consumer products, we've done a ton of software. Um, Excel has, has, although we haven't made any, no one's made an investment yet, um, the companies that we are in due diligence with are consumer products and software. So, some diversity. I think CAN has um, a lot more diversity. Yeah, we, uh, we originally started by saying, Pete, that we wouldn't do uh, therapeutics or, or pharma. And of course, for every rule, there's an exception. So we did that, and uh, we've now done two that are in that category. But a little later stage in the FDA uh, process, we've done two diagnostics. We've done a couple of med devices. We've done four consumer products. Um, you know, we've done a material science one, um, whiskey. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I it's, for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so I think, you know, we, you, you were reflecting sort of the diversity of our membership, 
Yeah. As I said earlier, we now have 650, you know, individuals. We're going to find some expertise, you know, in most any of these fields um, among our members. And, and so that helps a lot. Um, I know Jan and, and Mark remember, you know, going back a few years back, it was hard to get uh, people on a, on a uh, due diligence team who brought relevant experience to the questions that being asked. And mm -hmm. now, now by sharing all this knowledge and having that big a network, we've got a resources that we didn't have before. You have 650 in CAN or in the, um, the three universities? No, there, there's about 500 in CAN, Dan, and Win. Right, okay. And then I was adding on, you know, Mark's 80 and Jan's right. 60, and that's how I got to the 650. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. And Mark, how about, yeah, your guys' range? Uh, we're very similar to, um, to TAP. You know, we generally say we're not going to do pharma. We've looked at some pharma deals where it looks like there might be a path to an exit that's not going through all the different uh, fundraisers that typically have to, uh, you go through. But if it's a company that's going to have to raise $500 million, you don't want to get in as an angel investor in there because you're just going to get swamped along the way. You know, one of the areas that hasn't been mentioned yet, which is very big in, in the triangle, is agriculture. We see a lot of ag deals. And uh, some of them are very interesting. Um, there's a lot of things that are spun out of state. Um, there's a lot of things that come from Syngenta and Bayer and, th and things like that. But um, you know, overall, I think you get dominated by um, biotech, life sciences, and um, SaaS-based applications. It's the nature of the business. You see more of that than anything else. But you know, you look at the um, number of companies we're looking at right now. One is a company that's in the what. Um, it uh, had invented a new polymer for water filtration systems, a company called Nala. We're looking at uh, a follow-on round in a company called Revive, which has a, a device that's made for um, kids that have attention issues. Really an interesting thing, Vital Flow, which is a, a medical device company, a Periomics out of Virginia, which is a diagnostics company, WalletFi, which is a uh, FinTech company. So there are a lot of different areas that are represented. It's a come up a few times uh, on this call, but it seems, uh, you know, I know, especially can you're making some deals kind of later in the stage, you know, even past series A, series C, D, whatever. How, how has that sort of come about? Um, I mean, I think people will think about angels. They think they're very early stage, um, but it sounds like uh, in, the, in the triangle, some of the groups are moving further along. Just cur curious about that. I, I think uh, part of our you know model says we want early customers, early revenue, um, because we want to know that the dogs are going to eat the dog food. Uh, we want to be able to talk to them. We want to know um, what the churn rate's going to be, uh, how long is the sales cycle going to take, and so on and so forth. I think it was a bit deliberate on our part that we went further down the chain in terms of not doing seed stage. And I think that's in part because I remember TIG and Atlantis, um, they struggled to get an exit uh, and have a return. And, you, you know, by getting a little farther down the, the curve, Pete, you have a, we've already had one exit in, in uh, CAN in three years. So you want to have those success stories moderately early. You can't just have seven years of waiting for an exit. Right. Um, to get tired of it. Um, so that was part of the logic behind it was, let's get some early exits and make this, people feel good about what we're doing. What was the exit? By Virus. That was, um, they, they were the ones that developed, uh, in the days when you went to get surgery or had serious medical situation, you would get a phone call from some you know, random company or a mail survey saying, how was your experience? And that group had a 1% response rate. These guys developed a mobile app and tied it into the, into the, the hospital system. So they knew when you walked out, what you, who, who you had seen and what you had done. And they got 35% response rate. So the company that, the company that was doing the mail survey bought them. <laughs> and that was, that lasted only one, it was less than a year that uh, we we had an investment in so oh that's nice yeah return how about uh some uh, rtp or tap or are they also moving 
for some deals further down the pike? Yeah, we found at RTP Capital, you know, we're, we're driven totally by what our members are looking for. So we don't have to have a set criteria to change over time. It's unlike a fund where people are making a commitment and you really have to set your criteria up front. So for us, really, where are we going to be bringing in deals? And we know from COVID, people have become somewhat more conservative right now. There's a lot of people that are, are holding back. So we've tightened up our screening process somewhat that we really want to bring in companies that we think are going to really have an interest to members right now because they look even more promising than the typical company, you know, quote, typical company that we would have. But uh, this issue of exits is a really big issue in the triangle. There have not been a lot of exits and it has huge ramifications because people love seeing exits. They see the publicity for a good successful exit. They want to get involved in early stage investing because they see that. But people that are already involved in it have a lot of investments that are sitting out there in these companies that have gone for three, five, seven years now. And they don't want to put more dollars in. They'll use those investments when they exit for an evergreen. They'll reinvest that in early stage companies. But until we start seeing some exits, I think the flow of early stage capital is going to remain uh, pretty tight. I agree. And, um, I think TAP is always, like Randy was talking about, we've always looked for some evidence of product market fit. So the fact that a product looks great to us, if we're not the target market, that's really not terribly meaningful. Um, I've had entrepreneurs who've showed me their products and said, well, what do you think? It's like, it doesn't really matter what I think. What matters is what your target market thinks. Um, so that's, that is, kind of always been the criteria, but I, I think we have um, become more particular about having more evidence for all the reasons that uh, Randy and Mark have talked about. I talk mm -hmm. about. So that, I mean, that kind of leads into a question that sort of what, what do you guys look for most, you know, when a company is coming and presenting? It sounds like some traction, some product market fit. Is, is important. What are sort of the other things, you know, if you have sort of a mental or an actual checklist uh, when, uh, when companies kind of pitch you the first time, what are the things they have to sort of check off? I, well, I think I would okay. say three things, big, interesting market, great team, novel solution. Oh, yeah, you know, I go back to the, uh, the classic, it's the entrepreneur. And, you know, if you're going to bet on a jockey or a horse, you're far better off almost always betting on the jockey. So, you know, those three that you have. Well, you know, you think about it. If, if the jockey on Secretariat wasn't good, that horse might not have won. And the jockey that was on it might have been able to win with a different horse. It, it's, you know, you're looking at a crystal ball and you want that entrepreneur to have the same belief structure that you do as an investor. And, you know, there, there are a lot of different types of entrepreneurs. You have some entrepreneurs that are just a consummate salesperson. And that person might be great for a particular business. When they're pitching, it kind of sets you on edge a little bit at times because you think that you're being sold instead of coming in as a partner. So you've got to look at that. Then you've got the entrepreneur in a lot of cases that's a great technologist but needs the business assistance. So they come into you because you can help them with that business and they're willing to let you come in and help them get to that point. So there's all kinds of criteria that sit there with that entrepreneur. The other thing I'd add, Pete, is, um, you know, I think we, we all use the, the quality of the CEO, founder, whatever, and the characteristics we look for, coachability, et cetera. One of the things that's become more apparent to me over the last several years is not just the uh, founder, but the quality of their board and the value add of their board. And so you can take someone who's in, relatively inexperienced in the entrepreneurial world, surround them with a great board and uh, you know valuable experience there and they'll do well. And I, we also had an example where we didn't have a good board and it was a new entrepreneur and it's the only one that really cratered. Um, so, you know, I, I, I've come to believe that Jan's list is absolutely right, but I now think of management team differently or more broadly, maybe uh, as a result of our experience. Yeah, I think that's a great point Randy raises. And, you know, one of the tips I would give to entrepreneurs when they're pitching to any of us, they all have this beautiful slide that has their advisors and their board members. That's one of the first things we're going to do in diligence. And I can't tell you how many times you call an advisor that was listed 
and they say, what company is that you're talking about? And it's you know, somebody that they met at Starbucks and had one conversation when they put on that slide as an advisor. And all of a sudden, that credibility for the entrepreneur is just out the window. And it's very hard to recover from that. So make sure those advisors are really people that are working. How hands-on do you guys like to be kind of a after an investment? You know, your groups or you personally when you do an individual investment? Well, we, um, of the 19 deals, we have led uh, seven of them now. And we always take a board seat. And interestingly enough, Pete, I don't take the board seat or Chelsea doesn't take the board seat. We'll go into the network and try and find somebody that has relevant experience for what they need. Or we even, we've even gone outside of the network to find somebody to be that board member. Um, again, it goes back to my belief that it's the quality of the board that matters. So, yeah, as we've gotten bigger, because we're now averaging about 800000 per deal, we've been able to be a lead and therefore have the negotiation to get a board seat. <clears throat> I think it really depends. I mean, there there are some entrepreneurs that um, I was involved with before they raised their first dollar. And even, you know, they might raise money from TAN, CAP, RTP Capital, Launch Place. Um, and um, in, in at least some cases, I remain an advisor to the CEO, often uh, advising them about how to talk to their boards. Um, <laughs> Other cases, you know, very little involvement. I think it really depends on, on the team's coachability, whether or not I really can, you know, add value. That will determine whether I stay involved. And I think RTB Capital is, is different than both of those. Um, first of all, we've done a lot of deals where co-founders have been involved in something. David is a member of uh, RTB Capital, so very often – if we're investing in something that co-founders invest in, co-founders will be uh, the lead on it. They'll have representation and we'll stay in touch with them. Uh, we have a number of companies where we have an individual who's taken a board seat or has served as a formal advisor. We've got somebody who's a medical director for a business. Because of this, you know, the, the 60 or so members um, that, that we have active, it, there's a lot of different areas that people get involved in. And they typically do. So it's not an official RTB capital role but it's a member that takes a position. Now, Launch Place, on the other hand, gets very actively involved with their companies, not necessarily as board members, but they're there to assist those entrepreneurs. They work with them on a constant basis. It's part of what I do as portfolio manager. So it's really a great service that Launch Place can provide to those businesses that they invest with. I've been very impressed with that because they have paid staff. They really, they can do things like market assessments and uh, assembling prospect lists. I mean, they really, they really put a lot of effort into being helpful. Yeah, and that's a that's a key question that an entrepreneur should ask when they're going to a group: is what's your involvement going to be afterwards? Some people, some entrepreneurs want no involvement; they just want passive money. Most angels want to be somewhat involved, at least get reports, um, which is sometimes a black hole in itself. But other entrepreneurs need that group that's going to be really involved. So it's something an entrepreneur should really ask. Let's uh, let's jump into some questions, kind of hop in and out. So here's another one from uh, Ken Purchase. So he said, and Jen, you mentioned the Great Recession and sort of after people kind of put their portfolios back together, then they are investing more. Uh, that brings up uh, the topic on everyone's mind. How do you all see the uh, effect of COVID and then sort of current recession? Has that been... Have you seen an impact on, on angels, on investors? Is it hard? I mean, I don't know if anyone's trying to raise, or if you're trying to syndicate something now, has it been, has it been tougher? How has it affected thing on the, on the investing side? I think, I mean, weirdly, the stock market after just yeah. falling off a cliff has almost recovered. Um, I'm not sure I understand. Can anyone explain that? Yeah, Mark and I were talking about it before. I, I don't understand it, but um, so I think that has that has been one thing. But some companies have actually benefited right. from COVID. Um, I mean, Zoom is, is one example everybody knows about. But uh, Mark, you mentioned Revive Technologies. They, they're a device that uh, is a smart device for people who have ADHD to remind them to focus. 
Um, since parents are doing homeschooling, the um, direct-to-consumer business for them has just exploded. Um, yeah, they're, they're saying, uh, hey, that teacher was right about my kid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I know, I know that the, the groups that I'm involved with are, are paying attention to, um, is COVID good now? Is the new normal going to be good for this company going forward? Right. But but we're still looking at deals, both at, at you know at all the groups I'm involved with. I would say, Pete, that we've uh, we've done three deals since the beginning of March. Completed three deals. Uh, the first two, hardly any slippage in terms of number of members participating or dollars. The most recent one, um, we normally get about 45 people that participate. This most recent one that just completes this week has got about 32 people and probably, and, and it's around a little less than 500,000. So we're down a bit, Pete, in terms of uh, participation level and dollars going in. Um, but um, the deals are there and the members of, you know, those that are recovering from the stock market, as Jan points out, are seem to be interested in looking at deals. So um, I was surprised. I kind of thought we would shut down and, and just not be looking at deals, but um, that's not what the members voted to do with their money. Yeah, we're, we're pretty similar to that. First, first of all, I would say that anybody that's a day trader on this, um, webinar today has lost a lot of money because the market's up 700 points in the hour that we've been on. So, you know, with the chance of rationality that sits there, I, I don't get it either. I've been reading a lot about it. Um, but, you know, that's a topic for another day. Uh, one of the things I would note, I do a lot of uh, reviews of pitches, you know, pitch scrubs for, for entrepreneurs. And one of the mistakes that they make today is not including COVID in their pitch. There is not a business out there that's not affected. Some of them are, are in a great position, as Jan said, some are benefiting from it, but a lot of them have right. just all questions that they can't answer right now. But if you just leave out COVID from your deck, you're making a mistake because it's going to be asked and be upfront right. and put it in there what you think the, re, uh, the impact is of it. Uh, here's a question from Elaine Bull. Uh, she had a question about how uh, your groups are dealing with diversity, both for investors and entrepreneurs. I know, Jan, you were talking about the XL, uh, which is a great name, by the way, the E-L-L-E. Um, and, uh, and that focuses it also, I know it's female investors, but it's also female-led businesses exclusively? Yeah. Exclusively. Exclusively. In fact, that was... Um, one of the questions that the company that, that pitched at the end of uh, May uh, has a woman co-founder, but her picture wasn't on the website. So that was a, a big question mark. And um, you know, we've kind of gone back and say, is she really? <laughs> but yeah, um, I mean, it, it's an issue. Um, I know across the groups I'm involved with, we have not funded uh, many, um, women-led businesses or businesses led by people of color. Um, and it's frustrating. Right. We, uh, P, we've had uh, three of our 19 that have been female-led companies. Right. Um, and we also have, as part of our syndicate net network, Tom Drogi, who's, who's put together an African-American right. uh, program right. that you probably know about. We're uh, we're looking at one right now that's led by an African American. It's going to be our our June deal. Um, but yeah, that it's 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 a problem. Whether it's coming through our screening and what we who we see and so on, there's just not enough um, you know folks coming to us that have a diverse background like we would like to see. But so we're we're subject to who comes to our door and trying to reach out and find some as we do networking. But, um, you know, it is, it is a problem that we have. Yeah. And, you know, I, I will tell you, first of all, RTB Capital, almost since its very beginning, was 
keenly interested in this, and it's mainly because of Elaine Boley, who asked the question. She heads up most of our diversity um, yeah. at Guard Speed Capital. She's Is been she a plant. Come on, tell me honestly. I, I think it was a plant. Yeah, uh, she put a plant on you reading her name, but uh, you know she she's um, taken me to many Angel Capital Association diversity sessions. So it's something we've been keenly aware of. And I think the current situation that's going on in the country, not to get political at all, brings up the issue. You know, I've, I've said forever, we are colorblind when we look at deals. We are sex blind. It doesn't matter if it's a female, or you're bringing a female entrepreneur and maybe favor that entrepreneur because of that. But it brings up the question of being anti-racist and anti-sexist. And I, I think there are efforts that need to be made to try to bring in more of these groups because even though we give everybody equal access and equal consideration, right. there are issues that sit there that need to be dealt with. And I think that's uh, something that the current situation is really right. high. What are the extra hurdles that some of them might be facing before they get to, uh, to one of your groups? Yeah. You know, one of the issues that sits there that people don't realize is if you don't have a diverse membership, you can't fairly evaluate something. You don't know the issues that that minority entrepreneur might go through and be able to assist them or that female entrepreneur might face that, that the, the white male entrepreneur may not. Those are important to have as your members because they could really help you out in, um, in understanding those issues. That, that it's important too to, to consider the, the, um, the feeds to entrepreneurship. I mean, I know that the universities all have um, programs that focus on entrepreneurship. There, um, um, there are other organizations in the area that do. I know Bill Spruill, who's a, a very accomplished Black entrepreneur, and um, he he has mentored tons of other um, people of color. But it's it, it's it's like you've got to go back to earlier. Um, I know the Girl Scouts, Eastern North Carolina Girl Scouts, have been working on a uh, an entrepreneurship program and an entrepreneurship badge. And that's, that's where it's got to start. It's got to start with us reaching out and trying to participate in some of these, um, the feeder stock. Um, District C, I don't know if y'all have run across them. They, are, they have a program um, that's focused on entrepreneurship for um, middle schoolers and high schoolers. And it's a nonprofit and they're, they're really working on trying to build diverse teams. Yeah, and uh, NCCU has a very interesting entrepreneurship program. Henry McCoy participates in our syndicate meetings. Uh, as Randy said, uh, Resilient Ventures, Tom Drogi and Keith Daniels are doing really important things. Here's a question from Diane. Uh, so there's hundreds of angel investors that you guys talked about here. Are, are you guys finding that there's enough deal flow? Uh, sort of a question about the pipeline, maybe, and also what are investors looking for that they're not finding in the triangle, whether particular verticals or particular stage of companies? How do you guys find the deal flow? Hey, I'll, I'll jump on that. I think there's plenty of deal flow. The hmm. question is whether there's quality deal flows. It, right. There's a lot of companies that look very interesting, but are they investable? And you know, there are times where you have a zillion companies coming around and you feel badly because you can't invest in all of them or bring all of them in. Um, at other times, you know, right now we're trying to figure out which are the deals that look best in this current environment. And, you know, CED had 70, 70 companies present during their, uh, their tech summit. So we're trying to go through those and see which companies we want to bring in. And NC Idea just went through their grant program. So we're looking at those. There's a lot of different companies out there. It's, it's a difficult process to screen through all those because every one sounds great on paper. They just have to try to figure out which are the most investable for your members. And I do think that that uh, one of the things that as entrepreneurship has grown in, in the three universities or four with uh, NC Central, um, there are a lot of young, you know, kids go, coming through the academic process who dream about and have learned some of the lessons about um, starting a business. So the infrastructure, Pete, of, of having that in place and clearly many of them want to stay here. They would love to stay here. So um, I don't, I think Mark's right. I, I don't see it as a shortage um, of deal flow, you know, in this area. If anything, I think it's, it's how do we, you know, 
bring them to the level that they it would be acceptable investment for our 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 groups and how do they get that early coaching to get to that point um, but again because there's collaboration and help that they can reach out after they've graduated and find resources um, whether it's NCIDEA or any of the accelerators or incubators or programs like that. So I think we've got a really good foundation um, in place for sprouting some really new interesting technologies. Here's a question uh, from Mike Legalis. Uh, so we've talked some about exits um, and also that there haven't maybe been a ton recently, but also quicker exits. Uh, Randy mentioned that. So the question is, how would you define a quick exit? And how do you balance the preferences for both a quick exit and a large exit? Because in some ways, those kind of push and pull against each other a bit. Well, I, certainly a quick exit would be, you know, a year to three years. Mm -hmm. uh, by Veras was less than a year. Um, and, you know, I think uh, part of that balance question is um, what is the likely progress that you will make in the next, let's say we're saying year three is kind of the quick exit. What progress would you make in the next three to five years? And what opportunity are you leaving on the table for the acquirer to take you to the next level? Um, because every acquirer wants to see whether it's international expansion or a new market segment or something like that. You got to leave something that makes it exciting for them to buy you. Um, and so I think the balance is what are you going to do in years three to six that's going to change the dynamics and interest level. Now, in some cases, by the way, you've got to get to 25 million in revenue to be even considered but unless you have some unique proprietary piece. But, you know, so how will you be in revenue by the time you get to year three and five? And how quickly can you get there? I think yeah, those I are think, kind of balance. Yeah, I think this is one of the big differences between angels and VCs very often. You know, VC look at deals because they have a 10x possibility. Right. And they don't want to exit before that because they only have so many companies in their portfolio they're going to exit. And they know they're going to have some losers that they have to offset with those 10 right. Angels will look at deals that you have a realistic exit possibility one to three years with a two or three time multiple. And you know, I've, I've had these discussions with people. Why do you want to invest in something that only has a two times multiple? And I said, are you kidding me? Where else are you going to find a two times multiple that's got, that's relatively deep risk. I'll take that all day long. If you could really say that that's deep risk and it's a, it's a very real possibility. I mean, that's doubling your money. So you can double your money in a year, two years great outcome mm -hmm. okay. yeah, what's what's the old saying in the stock market pigs get slaughtered and uh, I forget the whole saying but yeah well, it's you know, greed, greed has cost a lot of people a lot of money over the years bulls make money bears make money pigs get slaughtered pigs get slaughter. thank you that's it all right then one last question uh from nikin i believe so as an investor how should one think about angel investing versus investing as an lp in a in a in a VC and a venture fund? Active versus passive in many cases. Mm -hmm. the, uh, when you invest in a, a venture funds, you're gonna be a passive investor. You'll get reports, you'll get updates on the portfolios, but sometimes you'll be asked to participate if you have a particular domain expertise. But for the most part, angels are much more active in the process. They're gonna help choose what those investments are. In a fund, you're not gonna have any voice as to what's gonna be invested. I, that's where I would put the primary. Yeah, the economics are also different because if you are an LP and a venture fund, 2% uh, of your money every year is going to go to fees. And then when there are exits, the um, venture fund keeps usually 20% carried interest. Right. Well, two and 20? Money back. Two and 20. Um, so after you get your money back, they take 20% of the gains. So you just have to decide what's, I mean, if you, if you want to be a passive investor and you're willing to basically pay for that service, being an LP could be a good solution. I would say one other thing too, which is um, particularly network versus funds. Um, you know, you, you end up 
putting in 50,000 or 100,000 into the fund. When you're in an angel network, you should probably, you know, set aside and I tell people when they join, tell me what your number is you're going to invest because you're going to invest that over three to five years and you need to allocate that money. So don't just think that you're going to make two or three investments and then, oh, I'm out of, out of money. So allocation of the mm-hmm. amount you're going to put in is really important when you join a network. Yeah. That's one That's of the cool. things I like about the fund structure at TAP because you, you have a committed amount of capital, but then I think I've been, I'm in a, have been in 18 deals with cross fund one and fund two. And um, so then I've made some individual investments through CAN and then just people I've got to know. So I'm hoping that my uh, eventual successes are going to pay back for the dogs that died early. Well, it sounds more fun to be an angel investor than an LP. I think so. Yep. Uh, And uh, thanks to all of you for tuning in. So now go home or stay home. Thank you, Pete. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Pete. Take care.